Hello, welcome back to Rust 101. This is video 25, and we've got a really meaty topic for you today. Uh, continuing talking about concurrency parallelism, and we get into lots of the details. We're going to move fast through this. It's going to be pointers to stuff that you might need to look up later. So how to do threads and concurrency. So let's start off with basic ideas of how to spawn a new thread. So a, a thread is something that executes uh, independently, from your main code, so you can have two things executing at the same time, um, and that might happen, it might run on a different um, actual CPU uh, in your computer, or it might be simulated by your CPU. You don't have to worry about that. Uh, but yeah, okay, so how do you make a new thread? You do thread colon colon spawn, and you give it something to run. So we're giving it f, which is this function down here, and saying please run this function in a separate thread, and then doing the same thing again, please run this function in a separate thread, and then we're printing out hello from the main thread. And what this function does, is it prints out hello from another thread, it gets hold of the thread ID, so you can basically, when, when you're inside a thread, you can tell which thread you're in using this ID. The main thread also will have an ID. Uh, and you can say, this is my thread ID, so it prints it out. Um, so yeah, the point is, these, the, these two calls to F may happen uh, concurrently. So the question is, what is the output of this program? Well, it might be something like this. Hello from one thread, hello from another thread. In fact, these prints might kind of inter, uh, intermix a bit more. Um, I can't remember exactly what the locking rules are around standard output, but at least in some programming languages you might find, like it started saying hello in the middle of um, saying something else that another thread was saying. I think in Rust it, uh, that's locked out, so it doesn't actually do uh, things quite that bad, uh, and then it, then maybe the main thread would say it later, or yeah, as it shows here, or they might interleave like that and then say hello from the main thread later, or the hello from the main thread might come earlier. But most likely, what you'll actually see is just hello from the main thread, and you won't see those other threads executing, and that is because the the entire process exits when the main thread thinks it's finished with its work. Um, it doesn't wait. Um, for any other threads that you've spawned to say they're ready before it just stops the program. So the program quite quite likely stops before printing anything at all. So how do we deal with that? Well, you can ask a thread to join. So you, you notice we got we get passed something back from thread spawn, which is this join handle, which we're calling T1 and, or T2. And you can call the join method on these threads, and that means wait until this thread has finished doing its work. So if this thread loops infinitely, then join would never return. So all of the code we're seeing here, this all executes in the main thread, right? So we spawn, we spawn another thread, and we spawn another thread, then we print something, and then in the main thread, we wait for thread T1 to say it's finished, or T2 to say it's finished. And when I, mean, when I say say it's finished, I mean stop executing, like run to the end of that, that function F. Um, if there was a panic in one of those threads, then um, it, then this join would return an error. So this is why we have these unwraps here, um, basically to say if one of our threads panicked, we want to panic here. You might not want to do that. You might want to allow your threads to panic and just deal with the error, in which case, instead of unwrapping on the error value, you would do something useful with it. Um, but it's very, very common to see unwrap on... Um, Things like join where they, they, the error condition happens if there was a panic in another thread. If you're writing code that just expects not to panic, then it's sensible for the main thread to panic when one of the threads unexpectedly panicked. Okay, so we need to think a bit about what's actually going on, right? So we said, please run this function f, uh, but that function f was very convenient because it didn't require any input from us. So a much more typical example, when we run thread spawn, is that we'll give it a closure. So these pipes mean a closure that takes no arguments, and then the body of the closure is inside these curly brackets, and it has this word move here, which we'll talk about in a second. So we create some numbers, we spawn a thread, and then we loop through, we sum all the numbers by calling sum, and then we divide the answer by the number of numbers, so we get back an average, um, and then in order to pull out that answer, we call t.join, and notice that join, I said it returns a result, which is why I've got this unwrap, but the, the main value of the result is the, the, the return value of the function that we ran um, 
that we gave to thread spawn. So the return value was the average. So we're putting that return value into this variable called average and printing it out. So essentially, we're delegating the work, the, all the work that this program does to another spread and the thread. And the main thread doesn't really do anything. It just sits there waiting for it. So it's a bit pointless, but it kind of does something useful. Um, so the question is, what is this move thing all about? And the answer is that um, uh, when we create a closure and spawn a, spawn a thread, we don't know how long that uh, thread is going to last. It might last longer than whatever function we happen to be inside here. So, it, And it needs to be able to use numbers um, for as long as it lives, right? Like, it, as far as the compiler is concerned, it uses numbers. Um, but numbers might have gone away, because this thread might last longer than this code that we're running here. Um, so the way the Rust compiler deals with that is to say, you've got to own numbers if you're going to um, use it for like an arbitrary amount of time. I give it like the, the phrase it would use would be like has a static lifetime. Um, meaning we just don't know how long this thread will last. So in order for this closure to own this numbers value, what we do is we say move before the definition of the closure closure. And that means anything that we refer to from outside, which in this case is only numbers, instead of um, it, us referring to it as a reference, we want to move it in. So we want to take ownership of it, which means it's no longer usable outside. So um, uh, th this is just a, like a further explanation. Basically, if we didn't do this move, there's no move here. We use numbers inside the thread. What if we drop numbers? Well, the thread might still be running, might still need numbers, but now that numbers has been dropped. Um, so it's not allowed. So that's why we need that move, and that's why we can't use numbers afterwards, which is what um, what we're doing here. So this is not allowed. Um, so that's pretty inconvenient, right? Like, so things last. Things you give to threads have to kind of last forever. For them. they have to be they have to be owned by them, basically. So there is something else you can do. You can use thread scope, uh, and what this says is that the um, the threads that we spawn using spawner dot spawn. So we, we thread scope takes in this uh, uh, takes a, a closure which itself takes a, a spawner as an argument. So basically, thread scope will call this closure with a spawner, and we know that, that spa anything, any thread spawned by that spawner only live inside this scope here. What this means is that we can pass numbers in as a reference. Notice that there's no move here, because we know that after the end of thread scope, after thread scope is finished, numbers is definitely not being used by this um, by any thread, because those threads are all finished. So we have to join inside the scope here and return the answer we got back from our thread um, and it kind of returns through that scope and into the average here. So we could use numbers out here on line 10 um, because we know by the time we get to line 10 uh, everything that happened inside the scope has finished and, the, and specifically any threads that were spawned by the spawner um, are no longer still running. Um, because at the end of sco uh, the scope, any threads that have been spawned get joined. So that means that uh, 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 we can just use numbers by reference. But it doesn't mean that we can break some of our other rules. So if um, if we got hold of if we got a counter, or a variable called count, which is mutable, we take a mutable reference to it called counter, and then we use it in multiple places. Um, we're, we're lending this mutable reference to this closure and to this closure. Uh, that's still not allowed, right? You can't. You're still borrowing um, a. You're still using a mutable reference in two different places, and that's not allowed. So, um, uh, a little bit about why we're not allowed to do that. So let's have a quick look at this diagram and think about it for a second. So the bottom row is the value of a variable that is somehow stored somewhere in memory. So it starts off being 10. And these two bars here are threads. So the bottom bar is just like what's stored in actual memory, what the real value is. And these two bars are threads, thread 1 and thread 2. So what we do is we read the value out of memory into thread 1. Um, and then we read again the same value into thread 2 
And then these two threads just go on and do their work. And their work might happen at different times, right? Because they're all running uh, concurrently. So in thread one, we add seven to that value in memory, this in, in, our, in our local thread memory. And we get the answer 17. And in thread two, at the same time, we've got this value 10 inside thread two. So we add five onto it. And we get the value 15. So these two threads are just doing their work. One of them needs to add seven. One of them needs to add five. And then both of these threads then save the answer back into memory. So the thread number one saves the answer back and gets 17. Thread number two saves the answer back. And so the final answer stored in memory is 15, when it should be 22 if we wanted things to work the way we wanted them, where we presumably want them to work, uh, which is that they both added numbers, and those, so both of those ads should be reflected in the final answer. So this is why we can't have shared mutable state, right? These two threads both have mutable access to this value here, and it causes problems. So that's what uh, Rust's borrowing rules prevent. Um, you can't do this in Rust because these two threads are not allowed to both have a mutable borrow of that original value. It's called a race condition. Okay, so, yeah, the, the borrowing rules prevent those kind of data races and also deadlocks, which are kind of caused by races in a way. Um, but they also prevent any kind of... Um, uh, interaction between threads where they're both changing a value. Um, so there's lots of really useful programs that might possibly be like well formed um, that you can't do using those rules, but there are ways around them. So first thing to do is to rethink how we've been talking about references. We've been talking about mutable and immutable references, and that was kind of um, like it, it really those are kind of motivating examples for what these references are. What they really are are um, what we've been calling in an immutable reference is really a potentially shared reference. Multiple people are allowed to have that reference at the same time, including multiple threads. Whereas a mutable, what we've been calling a mutable reference, now let's call it an exclusive reference. It basically means uh, when we have this, this mute reference, this exclusive reference, uh, that means we're the only person, we're the only thing that has that reference at that time. And in fact, no one else has any of these shared references either. So, in order to be able to modify values, um, we need exclusive access. So that's why we've been calling it a mutable reference. Um, but now we can kind of expand our ideas about how to get an exclusive, how to get exclusive access to that variable. We either have an exclusive reference, in which case it's easy, we've got it, um, or we own it so like no one else uh, owns it. And we we have to own it and also not have given away an, a mutable reference, an uh, exclusive reference to it, right? Um, but also, uh, there's another way, which is that um, the, the the type of the variable is it is automatically exclusive. It's kind of built in to the type, and there are some types like that. So let's have a look at them. So these types are called atomics, and they're instead sync atomic. And what, the way you work with them, so we create something like called an atomic U32, which is like a U32, right? But no one else can modify it when we're modifying it. We create a new one, put a zero inside it, and then we can add to it by doing a fetch add. So um, foo already has zero inside it, and we say I want to add 10 onto it. Uh, and we also get back, as part of fetch add, add, you get back what it was before. So this is a way that we can sometimes use to check that no one else has kind of um, changed it from what we expected. We know that we expected it to be zero. Um, so fetch add should return zero, and if it doesn't here, with this assert will cause us to crash. So that's just a, a potentially nice way of checking. It was in the state we expected it to be in before. We added 10 to it, um, and we also pro uh, provide this ordering thing. So that's outside the scope of these uh, videos, the exact meaning of those things, but essentially uh, it tells you like what guarantees you want the compiler or the um, processor to make for you when you're doing that change. So this stands for sequential something and um, uh, different types of like funny stuff can happen um, in the ordering of your arithmetic operations depending what type of ordering you pass in and uh, the kind of rule of thumb is like the more strict you are the slower you might end up making those calculations be so that was how to add something onto this atomic u32 um, you could also just ask what's inside by saying load uh, and in this case, probably what will come back will be 10. But not necessarily because some other thread might have modified it in the meantime. So the whole point of this is that this, this Atomic U32 can be used by multiple threads at the same time. They'll never have that problem we saw on the other slide where an add doesn't properly work. 
Um, but they, um, because only one, only one person will be working on the thing at a time. But what could happen is someone else could do an, another ad in the meantime. Uh, and they don't prevent that. Um, yeah, so here's the signature of, uh, fetch ad. All right. So that was for some very specific, basically those are just for numbers that you can use those atomics. Um, so there are also ways of protecting other types of thing. Um, which are more complicated from being um, modified while we're in the middle of modifying them ourselves. So there is this thing called a mutex, and you might have called, you might have heard of mutexes in other languages, but mutexes work in a quite a unique and brilliant way in Rust, which is that instead of them just being a way of getting hold of a lock and saying I have this lock so no one else can have it, um, what they, what mutexes in Rust do is they say they have a way of saying get hold of this lock. And when I have this lock, I can modify this value inside. It's kind of the, the value is kind of in Rust. The value is kind of inside the lock. In other languages, there'd have to be a convention saying, uh, "No one's allowed to modify X until unless I've got unless they've got the X lock." But in Rust, it's kind of enforced that um, um, mutex is lock something, something, and, in, and that thing is kind of inside them. So in this case, um, we we create a mutex called N. And it holds a string inside it. So this string it holds in, initially is has got the word foo inside it. And then in our threads, we can um, modify that string uh, inside that mutex. So we're launching two threads. Is it, is the, we're in a thread scope again here. Um, so we know that we've finished with n by the time we get to the uh, line 14, which is why we can use n. Um, but inside... Um, you, each of these threads is going to modify that n, and normally that would be not okay because they would need a mutable reference or an exclusive reference to n. But what mutex does is, is lets you modify something even though you've got a shared reference to it. So these have got shared. There's no move here. Oh, sorry, there's no move here. Uh, these threads don't own n. They've just got an, a uh, shared reference to n. But n is a mutex, so that means it has a method on it called lock. Um, and then we'll talk about unwrapping in a second. And then you can do modifying stuff to N. So in this case, we don't know what the answer will be at the end of this program. N might contain bar or it might contain baz. But the point is these two um, operations will not have happened simultaneously. When, after, when this thread has called lock, it has exclusive access to N. Um, so this call to lock will just stop and wait until this one has got has finished doing its work and changed it to bar, and then it will change to bars. Or it might work the other way around. This thread might call lock first. It will get exclusive access to the thing inside N. It will do its work and set it to bars, and this lock will be sitting waiting until it's finished. When it um, when that second thread is finished, this thread will kind of wake up and set it to bar. So the answer could be either, as I said, um, but they won't interfere with each other. They won't kind of it won't crash in some way because. Two people were trying to modify at the same time. It will um, kind of serialize their access, as in one will happen, then the other will happen. Um, and so you won't get a crash. It doesn't mean your program works really well, by the way. If you wanted it to end up with bar, it, it might, won't always end up with bar. It might sometimes end up with bars. So it doesn't kind of fix your logic. It just prevents you from um, getting like something that's halfway between bar and bars because the two of them were interfering with each other or something like that, prevents that kind of stuff happening. So that's the purpose of mutex, to just mean that even though I've got a shared reference to a thing, I, I can temporarily at runtime get exclusive access to it. Now, I said I'd talk about unwrap. So when we lock a mutex, um, we call, we generally just call unwrap on it and don't think about it. Um, but the, the reason we have this here is that if someone, if some thread panicked, while it was holding the lock, then the, the we don't know whether it's finished its work or not, right? So um, we call that a poisoned mutex. So if this th if this thread took hold of this lock and then panicked, then this thread would then get a an error when it called unwrap. It would it would panic itself. So if someone else took a lock and then panicked, when you try and take the lock, you'll get back an error. So it's very common to see unwrap on this just assuming like, no one panicked while they were holding this lock. Or if they did, I want to crash too. 
Okay, so um, lock locks the mutex, but how does it get unlocked? I said I said it kind of when this um, first thread is finished, the second thread will be able to get hold of it. But there's no call to unlock, so how does that work? Well, how it works is that um, mutex doesn't just return the thing that you were, were wanting it to. So in this case, it doesn't just return a string. Um, this, lock, this lock function doesn't just return a result of string, which we can call push on. What it actually returns is a result, as I said, but a, res uh, a result containing a mutex guard. And a mutex guard is a thing that says, while I live, uh, while this mutex guard lives, I own this value. Um, so no one else can get hold of, no one else can unlock, no one else can lock, sorry, um, until this mutex guard has been dropped. As I said, it returns, this lock result might be a poison error if some thread panicked while it's holding the lock. Uh, mutex guard is a proof that we hold the lock. But also mutex guard conveniently implements deref mute. So the reason why we can call push str here is, is we don't have a string. At this point we've unwrapped, so we've got rid of the result. Now we have a mutex guard of string. But mutex guard implements deref mute. So that means we can call push str on it. And it will automatically deref into a string in order for us to do that push stroke on it. And then when mutex guard, when the mutex guard gets deleted, gets dropped, that's when the mutex gets unlocked. So basically, at the end of this line of code or at the end of this closure, after we've called push str, um, we've finished with the mutex guard that got returned and we called push str on. So the mutex guard gets dropped, and at that point, the mutex gets unlocked so someone else can call lock on it all right so um, other things that we need to talk about if we're going to talk about um, threads and this is really just going to be introducing you to ideas that you need to look into further if you really get into this there are two traits called send and sync and these are auto traits which means they're automatically implemented on every struct or enum that you create unless you explicitly say this thing is not send or is not sync or if one of your, your your things inside your struct or enum are themselves not send or not sync. So generally everything's send and sync, um, but if you kind of break certain rules, then they're not. So the definition of send is you can send it to another thread. So that basically means if you've got that closure with a move um, that and the numbers is getting passed into it, as we saw in the example, in order for that to work, numbers needs to be send. So thread spawn says um, the the closure you give me needs to be sent. It needs to everything that it owns needs to be allowed to be sent to another thread. So most stuff is allowed to be sent to another thread. You know, number strings and structs or whatever that contain those things is fine to send it to another thread. Like the, our current thread's not going to be allowed to use it anymore, but this other thread can use it. So most stuff is fine with that. Um, sync means um, I can share it with another thread. So I can give out references to this thing and they can be used from both this thread and from another thread. And again, for most stuff, that's fine. You can just do that. Um, but for some specific uh, types of thing, that's not allowed. So let's talk about um, what's not send. So as I said, send, uh, it's something is sent if it can be sent to another thread. So you can transfer ownership to another thread. Um, now, an example of something that's not sent, and this is how you say something's not sent, by the way, um, is that uh, is a mutex guard. So that, um, on some operating systems, if you hold a mutex lock, you're not allowed to unlock it from another thread. So the way we prevent that happening is we say mutex guard is not sent. So that mutex guard that came back from the result um, of calling lock... You, if you tried to send that to another thread so that you could um, drop it later in that other thread, um, you wouldn't be allowed to do that. Um, but it is sync. Um, uh, yeah, okay, so there's loads more to say about send and sync, uh, which I'm not going to say. Uh, maybe in future I'll do some videos that cover uh, threading in more detail. Probably need to do some research before I do that. Um, this can get quite confusing. Um, but generally, those rules are there to protect you from doing something wrong. So your job when you get an error about this stuff saying, oh, this doesn't implement send, is to think, okay, what did I do wrong? What did I do that doesn't actually make sense? Um, I'm trying to send something to another thread that, that shouldn't get sent or something like that. I'm trying to use something from two different threads at the same time. 
Okay, another thing that we're just going to introduce you to super quickly and not talk about a great deal, but something that you'll use a lot if you're doing a lot of multi-threading, is a channel. Uh, in this case, a multi-producer single consumer channel, which is the one that I've used most often. So a channel is basically a way of sending stuff from one thread to another. And it's kind of the, if you've done any Go programming, it's the kind of, it's the thing, the, the mechanism that is like really commonly used in Go whenever you write Go routines. So in Rust, it's like, it's there, um, not quite as natural as using it in Go, but it it's, um, works pretty similarly, I think. Um, so they are multi-producer, single consumer, uh, channel, very useful for it, if you're doing a load of calculations, maybe you're calculating all the digits of pi. Um, so you spawn off a load of threads to do work. Um, so those are going to be producers, right? Because the answers that they provide, they're going to produce and send back to you. And then the main thread is going to be the single consumer. So you do loads of work uh, and then and give each thing at the end of the channel um, so that they can produce their answer, send it to you, and then you can receive it in the main thread and print it out, or, well, combine it together and print it out. So, uh, again, we've got a, a thread scope wrapping all this stuff. Um, we create a channel, and the return value of this channel constructor is a transmitter and a receiver. So kind of hidden underneath these two, there's actually this thing that is called a channel that you don't really think about. All you think about is a transmitter and a receiver. And because it's a, mu a multi-producer, single consumer channel, the transmitter can be cloned and passed to loads of different threads, but there should only be one receiver. So um, this you could, tra you could clone transmitter loads of times, spawn loads and loads of threads, and then inside this... Um, uh, Inside this thread, what are we doing? Oh, this is what, well, hang on, this is a scope, not a thread. So inside this scope, we loop through. Um, uh, yeah, okay, so we, we, okay, this is interesting. We do this repeat thing pattern to say, give me lots of transmit, lots of clones of the transmitter. Um, and then we take 10 of them. So now we've got 10 clones of the transmitter and we enumerate. So that means we get a number. Um, so we're iterating through. Uh, copies of the transmitter saying um, uh, spawn a thread move the transmitter in to that thread and then use the transmitter to send that number that we got given from enumerate uh, over the channel so we spawn 10 threads and each of them sends a number 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, up, up to 10 and then we spawn another thread and we move the receiver into it that's why this is move and we say um, every time you receive something, print out what you received. So spawn 10 threads with numbers in them uh, that they're immediately going to just send the answer back and then spawn another th single thread, which is a receiver. Um, and what the receiver does is just um, uh, wait to, to hear back from each of these threads. Um, and none of these sends will interfere with each other, right? They'll just queue up behind each other. Uh, receives the answers and prints them all out. So it's going to print out the numbers, but not necessarily in the order you expect. And because it's all in a scope, it's all, all these threads are going to get joined before we, before we exit the program. So this is all going to uh, wait for it to happen. So receiver is sent, but receiver is not sync. You can't use a receiver from multiple threads. There has to be only one receiver. That's the reason why that's the case. So, um, yeah, many times if you're wondering, how on earth do I deal with these rules about how I can't share I can't share a variable and put my answer in there or something like that. What you actually want to do is uh, create a channel, uh, clone your transmitter into every thread, uh, and then use your receiver to pull back the answers as they come in from these threads. Uh, there's lots, lots more to learn about um, threads and concurrency. And this book I haven't read, but apparently it's really good. So I'm very much looking forward to reading that book. All right. Summary of what we've looked at in the last couple of... Um, uh, videos. Uh, Rayon is really cool. It does parallel stuff without you having to think too much about it. Um, if you want to lend stuff to a thread, use a uh, scoped um, call so that it can guarantee the lifetime doesn't come forever. Um, if you want to modify something, you need exclusive access to it. So you need an atomic or a mutex or something if you're doing that from multiple threads. Um, and uh, if you combine together the borrow checker and send and sync, basically a lot of the bugs you would otherwise have written um, are not even allowed by the compiler. So this is why this is the fearless concurrency part, right? That 
uh, often um, if you get one of those weird compiler errors that you don't understand, it's because you potentially made a mistake and the compiler's protecting you. So try not to hate it. Um, try and uh, figure out what it's trying to say to you um, and figure out whether um, maybe you need a channel <laughs> is often the answer. Uh, often the first thing that I, I reach for is a mutex, and actually I probably should have made a channel. All right. Uh, thanks for watching. See you next time.